Uh, we're in Psalm 90 tonight. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to go ahead and open to Psalm 90. I was going to try and cover Psalm 90 and 91, but there is so many good things in both those Psalms that I didn't want to squeeze the two of them together and rush through it so we'd miss something. So we're going to take our time and go through Psalm 91, excuse me, 90 this week, and Lord willing, 91 next week. So as you can see by the charts that we've passed out before, that we're starting in the fourth book of Psalms, the fourth section of Psalms, uh, Psalm 90 through uh, 106, and the book of Psalms has been divided into five sections. I know I've talked about that before, but it's been known as the Pentateuch of David, and it correlates with the Pentateuch of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So the, the fourth section, of course, would be the fourth book of Numbers, and so these are sometimes called the Wilderness Psalms. So it's the same section, and Numbers is a book that teaches us, especially in this psalm tonight, to make our lives count. If you would, would you drop down to verse 12 just for a moment? I want to look ahead at that. He says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And so these psalms are associated with public worship, with worship of the children of Israel as they went through the wilderness, maybe uh, worship that you do when you're going through some wilderness or hard times. These were the psalms of worship at the tabernacle, and uh, they relate to our public life, our public worship. And uh, so there's some uplifting psalms here, and there's some real wilderness psalms as we go through this section. But Psalm 90 is the first psalm of the fourth division of the book of Psalms, and we read that it was written by Moses. You'll look at the title here. It says, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. And... Uh, Rabbinical tradition tells us that Moses wrote the next 10 chapters. We don't really know for sure because none of them are signed. There's not a name on any of them. So that's conjecture. But we also know that there were two other songs that Moses did write in the Pentateuch, Exodus chapter 15 and Deuteronomy chapter 32, as well as the blessings of the tribe of Israel in Deuteronomy 33. So the setting is out in the Sinai Desert. Moses has led the children out of Israel. They're heading for the Promised Land. And uh, because Moses wrote this, we know it's the oldest psalm of all of the psalms that are recorded. They're, they were heading towards the Promised Land, but you remember uh, at Kadesh Barnea, they set out some uh, spies. 10 of them came back and said, there's giants in the land, we don't wanna do this. Two of them came back, Joshua and Caleb, and said, you know what? God's with us. It's fine. But the people were afraid. They turned back. So God punished them. He said, fine, you can wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Actually, everyone over the age of 20 at that time was going to die before the children of Israel, the nation, would move into the land. So the psalm is Moses reacting to that crisis. He turned to God in prayer and sought the eternal abiding peace of the Lord. And then later in Deuteronomy, he would tell Israel, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. So uh, it was kind of a faith that sustained that Moses during these trying years, during these trying times in the wilderness. I mean, can you imagine, especially as you read through Numbers and you hear the complaining of the people, he's the leader and they're complaining about everything, the water, the food, uh, the leadership, everything. So Moses was sustained by the Lord. Now in verses 1 through 6, we see God's eternal nature and man's frailty. Remember, that's part of Hebrew poetry. We either have repetition of thought or contrast, and we're going to see the contrast in this psalm between God and man. God's eternity, man's temporalness. So he starts out and he says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. The word he uses for Lord there is Adonai. It's the sovereign Lord. The sovereign Lord is our dwelling place. The Hebrew word for dwelling place here can also be translated a refuge. Those of us that know the Lord know he is our refuge. He's our hiding place. He's the one we run to. Moses understood that God's help to his people didn't begin with the Exodus. It began with Abraham. God was helping his people from Abraham, Isaac to Jacob, uh, clear on down to the days of Moses. God had been their dwelling place, God had been their portion, God had been their refuge, and God has been their protection. So the eternal God exists above history. Generations come, generations go, but God is still the same. 
We read in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is unchanging. Man has always lived in the presence of God, whether he's wanted to or not. Uh, he's always tried to establish gods uh, or something that he worships, some things he gives his time, talent, and treasure to because he knows there's a God. When Paul went to visit Mars Hill, you read in the New Testament book of Corinthians, he went to Athens, he went to that place where he could debate the philosophers and the Stoics and the Epicureans, and he said to them, you know, I perceive you're a very religious people. And they were, you can go up there today and you can stand on Mars Hill and you look down and you'll see the ruins of temples and altars and statues. As you go through Athens, there's statues everywhere. And uh, they had gods on every corner. Uh, they deified literally everything. They had a, a god of love, a god of peace, a god of war. Anything you wanted to do, any activity you liked, you could have a god for that. Anything you wanted to feel, you could have a god for that. Well, I feel kind of rebellious today. Okay, I'll go worship that god. We'll get rowdy and drunk and do some crazy things. I'm going to serve that God, or I feel like this, or I feel like that. I'll serve that God. Paul goes on, and he says, you know, I noticed a statue for the unknown God, and this is the God that I've come to tell you about. He is with you. You're never going to escape him. Even if you don't know his name, he's there. I see a lot of people in our world today who are trying to be spiritual. They are following all kinds of religious practices. They're checking their horoscopes, they're chanting, they're meditating, they're reading spiritual books. But we find most of these things are apart from the Word of God or the teachings of Jesus Christ. It doesn't have much to do with the living God, but they know there's something out there and they wanna make some kind of preparation just in case. So they don't wanna be responsible to Jesus because that means they would have to surrender. So they rather try and work their way to heaven or nirvana or wherever it is they're trying to get to. We're always in the presence of God and we want to realize whether we want to realize it or not. He's always there. He's always watching. He always sees. David talks about this in Psalm 139. He said, Lord, if I flee to the midst of the ocean, you're still there. If I run to the depths of hell, you're still there. If I go to the heights of heaven, you're still there. You can't get away from the Lord. And Moses realized this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Moses knew about generations. He knew this generation was going to have to pass away before the next generation could enter into the promises of God, into the promised land. He knew paramount in his mind that God had allowed this generation a certain number of years and he heard from God that this generation would die. Verse two, it goes on and it says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now mountains were the most durable thing known in Moses' day. God gave birth to the mountains. God existed before those mountains. It was God who formed the earth and the world. It's showing us again the eternal nature of God, the everlastingness of God. And we're going to see a comparison to the transitory, to the temporary nature of man. There's a difference between being immortal and eternal. Man is immortal. We have a soul that never dies. We will live forever. We get to choose the place we'll live. But God is everlasting. He has neither beginning nor end. And I like that word everlasting. The Hebrew word eternal is the same as the Hebrew word for beginning. And the word everlasting in the Hebrew means the vanishing point. If you can think back in your mind before you were born, maybe uh, back to World War II, maybe the Vietnam War, maybe you've studied some history and you can go clear back to the Civil War or ancient history, maybe you've studied the wars in the ancient world, and you go back beyond that time before the world was created, however many years you think that is, and you keep on going till your mind can't comprehend any further, that's the vanishing point. Then you take that the other direction and you 
Think about the time we're going to go be with the Lord, the time we'll spend in heaven, the time we'll come back to rule and reign with him in the millennium, the time after that, whatever the next step is for us, and we go way beyond that time to where we can't comprehend anymore. A billion times a billion, a billion to the 15th power, however far that is. That's the vanishing point, and that's our Lord. From everlasting to everlasting, from the vanishing point to the vanishing point. We can't comprehend what was before or what was after. So maybe you can think back a, a long time ago, but you can't think back as far as the Lord is. He's still God, always has been, always will be. Moses saw himself linked with God's plan throughout the ages because he knew God personally. Verse three, you turn man to destruction and say, return, O children of men. Moses has seen the judgment of God turn man to destruction. He saw it in wicked Egypt. He saw it in rebellious Israel. And God returns man's frail body to dust. Literally here, he's saying, go back where you came from, from dust to dust, ashes to ashes, Genesis 3.19. Man is very small. Man is transitory. But through faith in Jesus, we become a part of eternity and we have eternal life. Verse four, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past and like a watch in the night. God is timeless. He dwells in eternity. Uh, Peter says something like this. You remember in the New Testament, a thousand years is as a day and a day is as a thousand years. What is it to the Lord? 6,000 years of man's recorded history. Hey, it's not even been a week yet. So short time to the Lord. So many are wondering, when will Jesus come back? How quickly? We, we want him to come. But he hasn't even been gone more than two days, according to this. We are concerned with linear time. This is the beginning. This is the end. God's not stuck in our time zones. There's a, an interesting passage in the book of Hosea. Uh, it's Hosea chapter uh, 6, verse 2. He speaks of Israel being out of the land for two days. He literally says, after two days, he'll revive us. On the third day, he'll raise us up that we may live in his sight. And we see that they were out of the land for 2,000 years. Now they've been raised up. They're living in his sight. Israel's back in the land. Verse 5, he says, You carry them away like a flood. They're like sheep. In the morning, they're like grass which grows up. These years that seem so long in world history are nothing to you, Lord. A thousand years, which seems to man to be a long time, are nothing in comparison to eternity or his being. In the morning, it flourishes, verse six, and in the evening, it's cut down and withers. There's that contrast again, the short span of man on earth, the brevity of man's life, man's frailty. You know, while I was thinking about this and Moses wandering through the wilderness with these people, knowing that this generation had to die, I think Moses probably attended more funerals than anybody else ever has. He probably saw over a million people die in the wilderness in 40 years. Think about that for a minute. I, I didn't do the math today, but divide a million by 40 years or by 365 days times 40, and you can figure out how many funerals there were each and every day during that wilderness wandering. Look at the illustrations of man's frailty here. We're dust in verse 3. A watch in the night in verse four. A night watch was usually about three hours long. A flood in verse five uh, that dries up. A sleep that seems like a few minutes. Uh, I know we've all experienced that. You wake up in the morning and you're still tired and it's like, whoa, that night was quick. Or perhaps you hit the alarm, uh, you know, the snooze on your alarm and, and in two seconds it goes off again and you go, hey, wait, I was expecting a, a little more time but it's like grass, it grows up, it's cut down in the same day. And this should show us why we need an eternal refuge. We are frail, we are dust, we are creatures of time. Unless we're related to the eternal God, we're nothing. And again, it's only through faith in Jesus Christ we can know God and share his eternal life. Now verses seven through 12 show us the contrast of God's holiness and man's sin. Verse seven, he says, we've been consumed by your anger and by your wrath, we're terrified. 
in the wilderness again, the people of God, the children of Israel were consumed by the Lord. They died and they were terrified by his wrath. I think it must have been crushing for Moses to watch an entire generation die, melt away in front of his eyes in the wilderness. And it's true, man is consumed by God's anger. We read in the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. And then back in the very beginning, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Now, some people will say, well, they didn't die right away. Eh, uh, Adam lived 900 and some years. If you want to take this day as a thousand years, he didn't even make it through the first day. Okay? So the wages of sin is death. We weren't made to die. We were made for eternity. We were made to live forever, but God wouldn't let us live forever in our sin. So he planned to take us out of this life and gave us another tree of life, the cross of Jesus Christ. Israel's rebellion at Kadesh brought the wrath of God. And in the book of Numbers, God even offers to strike the nation with disease and disinherit them. He said, look, Moses, I'll start over with you. And Moses, you remember, pleaded with God on the basis of his own promises and covenants. God, people won't believe you. You, you were going to take these people up. Lord, you've got to preserve them. Moses asked God to pardon their sins. And God did, but there was still judgment. There's always a penalty to sin. And as the, uh, that older generation had to die in the wilderness in the next 40 years, the world's longest funeral march. The wages of sin is death. Man dies because of sin, which is rebellion against God. Sinful humans live under the wrath of God. John tells us, he who does not believe is condemned already. That's why we need to get the gospel out. That's why we need to get the good news out, to let people know there is hope, there is life. You can live forever. You've set our iniquities, verse eight, before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance, or that could be translated the glory of God. Our most secret sins are lit up by God's glory. That's a scary thought, isn't it? He knows, he sees, he's there. It's all revealed. The book of Hebrews tells us, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Wow. Our secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. God sees the secret sins as well as the open and blatant sins. Now in verse nine, all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. Our days are like a, a sunset from light to darkness. Our years are like a sigh. Literally in the Hebrew that means it's like a rerun. God planned each one of us before the foundations of the world. And he knew what our life would be like. God knows all things. He's omniscient, all knowing. And him watching our life is like watching a rerun. When you leave the realm of time, you enter the realm of timelessness. There is no past. There is no future. Everything's present. Kind of like you were watching a football game on a Saturday and you turn on TV on Sunday, you already know everything that's gonna happen. Uh, maybe the, your team is doing poorly and the announcer's saying, will they come back in the second half? And you could say, no, I already know what's gonna happen. They're not gonna come back. They're not gonna win this game. Uh, you know what's going to happen. And that's our life before the Lord, a rerun. The writer of Ecclesiastes tries to explain this. He says, that which has already been and that which is to be has already been, and God requires an account of the past. If you figure that out, you have eternity wired. He already knows. He knows who we are, he knows what we're like, and living outside of the dimension of time, he sees the whole picture at once. We see it a day at a time. God sees all at once, he knows everything. What an advantage we would have if we could see everything at once in one time frame as God sees the whole thing. The Apostle John had that experience. You remember in the book of Revelation that John was carried by the Spirit unto the day of the Lord. And he was shown things that would happen after the church in the book of Revelation, after the things of the church. He was able to see the tribulation. He was able to describe the tribulation, the things that are going to happen in the future. 
uh, because God knows our life and God knows the end. The story's already been told. We finish our years, it says here, as a tale that's been told. It's already been written out. Moses again expressing the limitless of God and the limits on the temporary nature of mankind. Then in verse 10, he says, the days of our lives are 70 years. I love this verse. And by reason of strength, they're 80. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it's soon cut off and we fly away. There's a limit to man's lifespan. God says, you know, you're gonna live 70 years. It's an average. Maybe you might make it to 80 years if you're strong. And if you live 80 or beyond, it's gonna be a lot of pain, a lot of labor, a lot of, a lot of sorrow. It's gonna be hard. It's not easy. Now I'm getting up into that area and I gotta tell you, some things are just harder than they've ever been before. I was telling my daughter, it's just hard tying my shoes just to get down and get back up. So uh, I'm not ready to go quite yet until the Lord's ready to take me, but it does get harder. You can't do the things you used to do. You don't feel like you used to feel. I think in our day, we're determined not to die. You'll notice a lot of the ads on TV or radio or the internet are all about uh, health care plans, how you can stay alive longer. I, I get these crazy ads. If you go on this diet or if you eat this supplement, why, you'll have no more pain. You'll work out like you were 20 years old. You'll be healthy, you'll be happy like never before. And I, I just crack up at some of these. You're going to be going soon. You're going to be cut off. You're going to fly away. But if you really don't believe in heaven, you become obsessed with health. I think our culture and our country is obsessed. One of my favorite people in my life was my great-grandmother. She was 106 years old when she died. She loved the Lord. And I remember talking to her and saying, Grandma, are you gonna die sometime soon? Or are you gonna, this was just after she was about 100. I think she was 104 at the time. I said, are you gonna die soon? Or are you gonna wait and go in the rapture with the rest of us? She goes, oh, I'm waiting. She actually went to church till she was 95. They finally made her stop walking to church because they thought something might happen to her out there. It was a little dangerous for her. But uh, she was waiting out these days by reason of strength in labor and in sorrow, waiting to go to the Lord with us. I'm ready to fly away. I'm ready to be raptured with the Lord. You know, I don't think I'm gonna have to wait 70 or 80 years because the way our society is going and the things that are going on in the world around us look like that he might be coming much, much sooner. I have a motto that I kind of try to live by. It's like, live like he's coming tonight, I wanna be ready, but work like he's not coming for the next 100 years. So keep that in mind. Well, let's go on. In verse 11, he says, who knows the power for your, of your anger? As for the fear of you, so is your wrath. You know what? I am not going to have to feel the wrath of God, and neither are you if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Did that just move? Okay. Looks okay to me. <laughs> Who knows the power of your anger, even according... Uh, you have a lot of editing to do. Yeah. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. Now, I know I'm not going to have to experience the wrath of God. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, neither are you. Because he took God's wrath upon himself. When he took our sin upon himself, when he forgave us, he paid the price completely. The work was done on the cross of Calvary. Now, Moses goes on and he prays for wisdom. He says in verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us there means it's something that has to be learned. It's not something that's automatic. You know, most people aren't really aware of the shortness of life, the brevity of life. Young people especially, I think, they don't think they have an end. They don't, they don't care. They don't think that they're gonna die. Now the practical conclusion is that if we understand God and his power, we wouldn't want to waste our lives. We'd want to use every moment we could. So Lord, help us to realize the brevity of life and that we need to number our days to make our lives count. Remember, Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it's Christ who has made us 
wisdom. First Corinthians says, but of him you are in Christ who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. If you have Christ, you have wisdom and you have life. Again, man's frailty, number our days. God knows how many they are. He knows uh, when we're leaving this earth. I need to number my days because I don't know when my last opportunity to serve him is going to come. What would you be doing if you knew this was your very last day on earth? I know some of the people I've talked to would say, well, I'd get right with Christ today. Uh, you don't know what day it's gonna be. Others would be saying, wow, is this all there is? Is this all the time is? It seems so very short. Well, I'll, I'll give my life back to the Lord right here. I better use this quickly. I better use it wisely. The book of Ephesians tells us to redeem the time. Literally, it means to buy up the time because the days are evil. And I don't think we have to comment on that. We can just look around or listen to the radio or read the newspaper. We waste so much time on temporal things. And uh, here's a little project for you. Get up one day and pretend like it's your last day on earth. How are you gonna spend that day? What are you gonna do on that day? Uh, uh, I think we'd be surprised if we found out how many minutes we had left. So let's use that time wisely. Let's use it to the best of our ability. Value each day so we can, inquire, so we can acquire discerning minds. Then in verses 13 through 17, we have a short series of prayer that God will bless his people. You know, man is not an animal that lives and dies. He's made in the image of God, and he does yearn to have his life mean something, to accomplish something, to account for something. Too many in our world are caught in meaningless existence with uh, no purpose or no challenge. I see that in a lot of the younger people. We need to yield to Jesus Christ, like Paul said, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Verse 13, he says, return, O Lord, how long? And have, comp have compassion on your servants. Moses is praying for God's favor. God has judged Israel, and now Moses is praying that he will restore them to favor and blessing. Uh, he prays for joy. Imagine 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and 40 years of death. Not a lot of joy there, but imagine burying hundreds of people every day. Be hard to be joyful. That's the only possible way to have joy is through the Lord, though. Or that's the only possible joy is through the Lord. Verse 14, O oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that, me we, that we may rejoice and be glad in our days. In the morning, the children of Israel used to go out and gather the manna from God. And I think our prayer should be something like that. Lord, meet us in the morning. Awaken us each day to a new day. Feed us on your word and give us joy in your presence. Verse 15, make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us the years in which we have seen evil. Moses again asking for gladness in proportion to the sorrow that they've tasted. They've walked through days of affliction. Some of you have too, and they've been through evil, but we have great joy to look forward to. In the book of Corinthians, it says, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Verse 16, let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. Moses longs to see God's power at work on behalf of his people. And not just the people of that generation, but it would be something that would be passed on to and seen by their children in a future generation. And then he gives a closing prayer and he prays for God's blessing on man's work. Verse 17, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. You know, there's so many hours we give to certain projects and uh, they come to nothing. We work so hard sometimes and uh, put in hours on something. It's, it's like building a house. You can spend days and weeks and months and a fire can come and take it away in one night. 
I'm not saying you shouldn't build a house, but consider the things you're using your time for. The things we do for the Lord are established. Those things we do will be eternal. Paul tells us, he said, our labor for God is not in vain. Now, one thing a lot, a lot of us look to uh, that the world offers is rewards for our labor. I know if I do something in the world, I'll get rewarded. And sometimes we try to carry that idea over to the Lord. You know, if I go out and witness, God will reward me. But if they don't accept the Lord, God won't reward me. God doesn't work on that kind of system. God never asks us to go out and share for a reward. We're actually told, all we're told to do is to share the Holy Spirit will add unto the church daily, such as should be saved. So all he wants us to do is to be faithful in the things he's called us to do. So he says in here, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. That word beauty means grace and kindness. Let the grace and the kindness of God be upon me. When people see me, when people meet me, I want them to see the grace and the kindness and the love of Jesus Christ. I want them to see there's something different in my life and I wanna be able to tell them what it is. It's Jesus. So let the, the beauty of Jesus be seen in me and establish the work of our hands. If our work is established, it's going to be the Lord's work because it's going to be something that's eternal. Anything else is just going to fade away. So yes, establish the work of our hands. Moses is watching the children of Israel wander through the wilderness. Their lives seem so useless, so wasted, so empty. And he doesn't want to see them as a waste. He wants them to count for God's glory. So he prays for God to establish his work in and through his people. You know, in the same way, we see people wandering around in our world and they seem empty and they seem purposeless and they may seem even useless. And uh, we need to pray for them that God's work of salvation would be established on them, that they would come to know the Lord, that they would have a plan, that they would have a purpose and they would have eternity. Apart from Jesus Christ, I believe life is pretty much unbearable. If there were no God, if there were no glory, uh, why would we want to endure the trials of life? I think we'd be like those people, those sinners who would say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's all we've got. Life's not a burden. Life's not a sigh. Life's not a sleep in the night. With Jesus, it becomes an adventure. It becomes a challenge. It becomes an investment in eternity. So Lord, teach us to number our days that we might live every day for Jesus and we live in your wisdom. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again tonight for your words, for the things you've recorded in your word. We ask that you would help us and take these things from our head down into our hearts, that we might be more than hearers of the word, we'd be doers of the word. Lord, we would seek you that you would teach us wisdom, Lord. We're reminded tonight that we will soon fly away. Life is short, but there's something much bigger and better coming. Your kingdom and eternity and heaven. Lord, may we embrace your promises and may your beauty be seen in and on our lives. Father, I ask that you'd bless those that are listening to this study. Blessed be your name forever and ever. Father, we ask these things now in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. And Lord willing, we'll be back again together next week for Psalm 91.